Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, um, and uh, welcome to the um, News Museum in Washington, D.C. My name is Dominic Warre. I'm a senior director um, at the World Economic Forum, um, and we're here this morning uh, to talk for the next uh, hour um, about uh, an incredibly uh, complicated but potentially challenging issue to um, our global economy, and particularly growth, and particularly growth for emerging markets which are facing a stress of an environmental nature which perhaps hasn't received as much thought or discussion as others in recent times, and that is water, water security. Um, you'll have received a packet of information um, which will contain um, a book uh, which looks like this, um, which is a publication we're delighted to be launching here in uh, the United States um, through this uh, meeting this morning, which is a unique uh, publication that brings together expertise and insight from across the academic, business, uh, NGO, and other thought leader communities, including uh, religious leaders, social entrepreneurs, and others, all of whom are experiencing in one way or another um, a sense of urgency um, about how we sustain our economic growth in the face of a water security challenge which links together our desire to increase agricultural productivity, to meet increasing energy demands, to deal with urbanization, industrialization, and sustain and manage our environment. Um, I'm delighted um, to uh, offer you an incredible range of insights from the panel that we have uh, this morning. I shall introduce them in a second. How we will run this conversation is that we'll hear from each panelist for about three to five minutes um, on various aspects of this topic. Um, and then uh, we'll take a couple of questions um, from the floor. So um, alongside me uh, this morning um, for this panel, I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, Peter Brabeck Lamap, who is the chairman of the board of Nestle, a foundation board member of the World Economic Forum and chairman of the Water Resources Group, of which you'll hear more soon. Also, Samantha Gross, who's the director at IHS CIRA, Cambridge Energy, Energy Research Associates, um, who contributed extensively on the energy uh, part of this conversation. Also alongside me is um, Abmanu Lal, who's the Alan and Carol Silberstein Professor at the Department of Earth and Environmental Engineering at Columbia University, who has taken an extensive look at water security in the context of uh, climatic variability. Usha Rao Manari, who's the Global Head of Water at the Global Infrastructure and Natural Resource Department at the International Finance Corporation. And the IFC are taking a lead role as one of the MDBs um, within the MDB family to look particularly at this interlinked issue and particularly at that public-private interface on water. And Jeff Seabright, Vice President for Environment and Water Resources at the Coca-Cola Company, um, one of a number of our industry colleagues um, who are helping the World Economic Forum and this broader collaboration on the water space. There are a number of others um, in our uh, consortium who are working on this, and um, I'm delighted to welcome our, our colleague from PepsiCo, um, who, Elizabeth, who is in, in the front row, and um, no doubt uh, will be able to answer questions from that dimension as well um, to illustrate the breadth of uh, collaboration that we have on this topic. So without any further ado, um, let me kind of uh, engage the panel in a discussion for you about uh, why this topic of water security, and particularly this linkage point between water, food, energy, seems to be so important, and so important to um, companies, as well as institutions, as well as academics. And if I could start with you, um, uh, Mr. Brabeck, why, why is this topic um, such an important issue um, for you? Well, good morning, everybody here. Um, let me first start uh, my perspective as the chairman of Nestle, because uh, that's at least where my journey started in this. When we were celebrating the 140th anniversary of our company, I was uh, seriously thinking about what was the most important factor that would uh, be necessary to solve to celebrate another 140, so a 281. And after going through all the details, finally I came down to one thing, which was water. Because without water, soon one realized there wouldn't be consumers. Without consumers, there's no business. <laughs> First thing, there wouldn't be life. There wouldn't be uh, sufficient raw materials. Agricultural production needs water. One, one liter of water for one calorie 
if the calorie comes from the plant, 10 liters of water for one calorie if the calorie comes from meat. That's a very important figure because you will see how it impacts afterwards and the water demand curve, okay? Uh, without water, we wouldn't be able to produce because we need water also in the industrial process. And without water, the consumers wouldn't be able to, pr to, to really prepare our products because most of our products are dehydrated and afterwards need water in order to reconstitute. And finally, we are also the biggest bottled water uh, company of the world. So also from their side, we need water. So it crystallized down. Water was the most important single aspect in order to assure the sustainability of our business in the long term. That, that's the way how I came to the thing. The next step was well afterwards to have a look and to see what is the water situation in this world? Is this anything that would be challenging? And there I must say, to my big surprise, I found out a very, a very critical situation, which induced me uh, to talk in Davos about five years ago. In a room there were f fewer people than we had here, we were, I think 10 people in the room, talking about the water crisis in the world and everybody was a little bit surprised. And out of this uh, conversation, we started to look and make an analysis, what's the real situation? And the more we looked into this, the more we also talked with our peers, uh, with our friends from Coca-Cola, from Pepsi-Cola, from Saab Miller, from many, many other of our companies, and we suddenly started to, to share the same idea that we need water, and this becomes extremely important to, for the sustainability aspect, and we decided to come together and to create a group in order to get more information about it. In parallel, the World Economic Forum had the Global Agenda Council established on water where uh, members from uh, academia, members from the NGOs, members also from, pri from private companies were working more in details and more scientifically about the water situation. The outcome was that finally we created this water resource group and uh, we asked, uh, on the one hand, IFC here, on the other hand, uh, McKinsey, to help us to make a serious undertaking on this water situation. And what we found out was very s simple, that water is, on the one hand, uh, a global issue, but it can only be looked at on a local base. Local means not national base, because it has to do with water basins. And water basins, in many times, are shared with different nations. So it's not, it's local, in, it's regional local in this sense, it doesn't mean national. And we, are, we analyzed 154 water basins over the world, and we established uh, during this analysis that already today, as of today, we have an overexploitation of water resources, which is 300 cubic kilometer of water. Let me just put this into framework. We need about 4,200 cubic kilometer of water for uh, the, the, the human uh, re, uh, for, uh, for the human consumption. We have 4,200 kilometer of water which we need for the environment. Extremely important to keep the environment going. Okay, we are already today overusing 300 kilometer. Now, who is paying the 300 kilometer cubic kilometers? It's environment, and that's the reason why you see the Hoover Dam getting less and less water. That's the reason why you see the Ara Lake having diminished 75% in 25 years. I mean, cities that were harbored 25 years ago are now 100 kilometers away from the lake. Do you see that the five biggest rivers don't bring water anymore during months during to the sea? The deltas are drying out. So our overusage of today is being paid by the environment. That's why we still have water, but we are using water which is not replenishable. Now, when we looked forward into the year 2030, we established that we will have a water gap of about 40%. And this 40% water gap, without any other parameter changing, would mean that we have a 30% uh, core, not only corn, um, how do you say it, grain production in the world in danger. So, this problem is becoming a food security problem, very clearly. Now, this is under actual circumstances. If, now, you add to this two facts. First, 
the further increasing population growth, and we know that now uh, since a week ago, we know that we are not going to stop at 9 billion, we are now most probably going to stop at 10 billion, which is another billion more, which means that every second we have three people more to feed, and every second we have 0 0.2 hectare arable land less due to erosion and urbanization. You can already feel the pressure which is coming there. Plus, on top of it, a new political aspect, which is a biofuel, which, just to give you an idea, it needs 4,600 liters of water to produce one liter of bioethanol. It takes 9,100 liters of water to produce one liter of biodiesel. Now, this comes on top of all of this. Very clearly, we are in the middle of a major, major water crisis already today. And this finally uh, brought us then to int introduce and create a new institution, which is the World Economic Forum Water Resource Group, which ha has been established in uh, 2010 and which is now working with several uh, governments in the world in order to find solutions to implement solutions that we have already elaborated. And those governments we are working, we have been signing up with, is basically Jordania, Mexico, India, and uh, just uh, two weeks ago we signed uh, with South Africa, and next week or next week after we're going to Mongolia and sign with them. So that's more or less where we are. And this is a perspective that we as a food company and why we are so much interested in to this. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, um, for particularly providing that overview um, of why a food company um, of such proportion is engaging so um, in incredibly in this discussion. Now, from food, and you touched upon it briefly, um, to energy. And I'm delighted um, to welcome Samantha Gross, the director of IHS CIRA. Um, and uh, IHS here contributed to the book on the uh, energy play and this water energy nexus is becoming quite a key discussion area as we have seen in the water food, water agricultural nexus. Um, and um, Ms. Gross, I wonder if you can give us some insights into this uh, dimension of the nexus challenge. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dominic. I'd just like to start by s extending a warm thank you to the World Economic Forum for bringing much needed attention to the interconnected nature of water challenges. I'd also like to say a quick thanks to all of you for being here to think about this important issue first thing in the morning on Friday. So I'm here to discuss the energy portion of this report, both what the energy water nexus is and some principles on how to thinking about it, particularly when making decisions about future energy systems. The so-called energy-water nexus really flows in two directions. Water is a critical input to the production of nearly all forms of energy. And on the other hand, energy is a critical input to the provision of water and the treatment of wastewater. On the energy side, the energy sector and policymakers are really used to thinking about energy supply along three axes. The first of those is energy security. The second is environmentally friendly energy, or low carbon energy. And the third is low prices, or the economics of that energy supply. When you add the additional parameter of conserving and protecting water resources, you make the challenge of providing energy to a growing and more prosperous world even greater. Adding this additional parameter sort of changes the way you think about certain things. He alluded to um, biofuels, which can be very water intensive. There's also the issue of concentrating solar power. We've heard about that a bit in the southeast here in the United States, or the southwest, I'm sorry, in the United States. On the water supply side, water supply in many parts of the world is becoming steadily more energy intensive particularly in rapidly growing areas. One example, pumping water long distances and over mountains to Southern California here in the United States uses 8% of total California electricity supply. Even larger such projects are under consideration in China and in other parts of the world with real implications for energy demand. In the Middle East, desalination allows us to almost literally turn oil and natural gas into fresh water. 
but this is a tremendously energy intensive process. Given these interconnections between energy and water, what are some principles that um, thought leaders, policymakers should apply when thinking about the energy water nexus? The first principle is that water and energy issues cannot be viewed in isolation. Considering the interplay between the two can help avoid unintended consequences of energy policies or of water policies. Second, and we've alluded to this earlier, all water issues are local. Dominique and I joked a bit before, the, um, before this session that the more times we said the word local up here, perhaps the better this presentation would be. The value of water and the availability of water differs tremendously in different places around the world. And in this way, thinking about water challenges is very different than thinking about climate change challenges. Since CO2 emitted somewhere in the world is the same as CO2 emitted anywhere in the world. Water challenges are just the opposite. So these principles lead us to the conclusion that there's really no one-size-fits-all solutions to water and energy issues, or extending that really any water issue. The world needs local solutions to local challenges and multidisciplinary approaches. Water touches every part of our economy and ecology, and we lose sight of this fact at our peril. Thank you very much. Um, this uh, um, water energy interplay is, it's a, is a really fascinating frontier that, that's opening up. And my understanding is that um, um, by 2030, there's going to be a 40% increase in demand for energy or thereabouts in, in the US. And at the moment in, in this country, um, close to 50% of all freshwater withdrawals are for energy. Um, so if you think about some parts of the country, how are those two things going to square? And does an energy policy effectively become a water policy when you have governments which are quite organized in sort of verticals as opposed to cross-cutting bureaucracies? I think those are the kinds of challenges on the government side. And then a, a range of technology issues. So I commend um, the work that IHS Sira did in this, this book. You'll find all kinds of facts and figures um, about the water energy interface in there. Now, just to make your morning even more uh, complicated, let's add another layer. Um, and uh, let's go to um, uh, Professor um, Manu Lal. And, and maybe you can um, draw us into this um, rather complex interface of the food, energy, water play um, in the context of perhaps climatic variability and, and, and those sorts of issues. Professor. Thanks, Dominique. Uh, I, I think I want to preface my remarks by saying that humans have, human societies have always existed at the fringe of sustainability. Uh, people have found ways to exploit the resources locally available to them to the utmost extent before they move on. The problem we face today is that we've reached the limit of where we can move to, and that's really what's driving the climate change issue. Uh, since that's a well-publicized issue, I don't think I'll spend a whole lot of time on that, but move quickly into the climate variability aspect, which has been with us forever. You know, if, if you are biblical, you have the seven years of famine and seven years of plenty kind of story. And the modern context of this is rather interesting. What we see is that there are many places in the world where now groundwater is being depleted at high rates. This could be the Central Valley of California, the Midwestern United States, North China, North India, and so on. The question is, is this depletion happening because people are overusing a particular resource, or is it related, in fact, to climate variability? And the number I would throw at you in that context with regard to food is the following. The productivity of irrigated agriculture, where you can reliably supply water, is three to five times the productivity of the same crop with the same application of other inputs um, under rain-fed conditions. The salient difference here is the variability in rainfall and what drives that particular yield from that point of view. So what has happened in the last 20 years is worldwide there's been an explosion in groundwater use because surface water storage systems have not been working very well. This comes with a dramatic increase in energy usage for agriculture driven by the water usage in agriculture. Uh, 
politicians have subsidized this, which means that effectively there's not a cap on this particular story that would come normally. And it's you know really driven by the climate variability aspect of this. In countries such as India and North China, um, and Northeast Brazil, for example, or California, the range between the average and the minimum amount of water available over a period of a decade in specific years can be as much as five, okay? So if you have a way to draw that water, you then get somewhere out of it. The other side of the story is also interesting. Uh, probably people have heard about the 116 day flood in the Indus River in Pakistan last year and the current flooding in the Mississippi and the perpetual flooding in Southeast China. Now keep in mind that Southeast China also happens to be the global manufacturing hub today and the global shipping hub for manufactured goods. So if you go on the other side of the water security issue, namely floods, the thing that we are getting exposed to by being a globalized society is the vulnerability both on the drought side and on the flood side of all societies globally to manufacturing or agricultural production deficits in a particular place and failures of supply chains to either deliver to that location or to deliver out of that location. So comprehensively, I think the place where climate change is finally going to have a most serious impact is not going to be because of the increases in temperature, but because of the changes in the patterns associated with precipitation and the severity of the nature of floods and droughts that we face. And this is something that we've been working on and trying to investigate, uh, mostly from looking at how we can address water problems more effectively in this context. The one thing that has emerged from that is by looking at paleoclimate and by historical climate, we learned that climate actually is not random. Depending on where you are in the world, there is substantial structure to climate. The seven years of famine and plenty kind of repeats with different sort of time cycles. For example, the El Nino Southern Oscillation that some people may have become familiar to is a three to seven year phenomena. There's a North Atlantic Oscillation, which is an eight to 12 year phenomena. Mongolia was mentioned. Mongolia responds very strongly to an Arctic Oscillation. And last year was you know a time when most of their animals died, the, the most severe zood ever they ha that they had. So those kind of phenomena, it turns out that A, can be priced into a risk model because these are clustered risk situations. And second, we have been successful at developing season ahead forecasting capabilities for many places in the world now, which then allow changes in both production characteristics, insurance pricing models, as well as reservoir operation models and pricing structures for groundwater to provide the right incentives. So what I'm trying to conclude with is that not only are there risks associated with climate, but careful study of the implications for the climate structure globally and locally, in the places that we work with, provides a fantastic opportunity for addressing the supply and the demand side of the water systems at the macro level. So that's a bit different message than what you normally hear, because people mostly start have started focusing on water security, which is exciting and outstanding from my point of view. But when you start looking at the solution space, you have to look comprehensively and climate plays a very interesting role. So I'll stop with those comments. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I did warn you that we'd kind of be layering up the complexity um, in this in this conversation. What I think is, is fascinating is as we collectively have, have gone through this debate um, about the economic system that we find ourselves in is that whilst water um, is local, the, the, the system economically that we're in now globally with these supply chains and value chains inherently can create um, more international ramifications, particularly if one, two, or three parts of that supply chain globally um, in various regions around the world start to suffer from um, too much or too little water in terms of this climatic variability. And that's um, a slightly different kind of message on this um, 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 climatic story than I think perhaps has been um, suggested otherwise as you were intonating, which um, in terms of pragmatic, practical solutions to create resilience in the economy, I think is um, something quite tangible to grasp upon as opposed to a general sense of um, we have this looming crisis and what on earth can we do? Now, um, against all of this, if I could turn to uh, 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 Jeff Seabright from the Coca-Cola company, um, wearing perhaps both your hat, but also um, um, the hat of um, many more of your uh, um, um, companies in the uh, food, beverage, retail, consumer good arena. Um, this all sounds terribly complicated. Um, why 
do you feel that um, um, many more companies like yourselves and others are, are becoming quite um, focused on this issue? What's going on? Uh, well, thanks, Dominique, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, I, well, I think Peter Brabeck um, uh, outlined it in his uh, opening remarks. Uh, you know, water is really a productive factor or input for business, right? Whether you're in the pharma sector, pharmaceuticals, or, or agriculture, food and beverage, energy, um, chemicals, water is a, is a critical resource. But there's a growing awareness, I think, in, in the business community, in part due to the dialogue through the uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, but also in, in other venues, uh, really over the last four or so years, I would say, uh, a growing awareness that this that this critical input, which is um, uh, you know a, a, a key business imperative, is a resource, a shared resource that's under growing stress um, around the world. And I think we're seeing more and more signs of that. And I think businesses uh, are increasingly getting focused on it. The CEO water mandate through the UN Global Compact. You see more and more businesses reporting on on water related issues. Uh, so I think there's a, a growing awareness um, in, the, in the business community. Certainly for my company, Coca-Cola, uh, you know, we are a beverage company, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, BP talked about you know, beyond petroleum, you could perhaps think of that in, in terms of renewable energy uh, in, in the future. There is no beyond water uh, in, in our sector, and it's a, it's a, it's a critical, uh, critical input. We've been reporting it in our SEC 10-K filings with the, uh, um, the U.S. Uh, Securities Exchange Commission uh, as, a, as a strategic risk uh, for since 2003, uh, that, the, that both quality and quantity of water uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a risk and one that, that we need to be addressing. Um, we've actually, uh, within Coca-Cola, taken a pretty deep look at it. We have roughly 1,000 um, franchise bottling plants in about 200 countries, so we have a pretty wide spectrum of experience with, uh, with water. And the real learning for us is that, whereas in the past we might have looked at water in terms of what we do within the four walls of our, our operations in terms of water efficiency, very important, wastewater treatment, very important, uh, but we really need to look outside the four walls and understand what's going on in the watersheds, which are really nature's water factories that are really the first line of, of our supply chains um, around the world, and understand the other shared users in those watersheds uh, and how we, as part of the, the solution, can work with them to, to address some of the challenges uh, in, in sort of a common, uh, common effort. Um, we've set for ourselves a goal by 2020 of giving back as much water as we use in our direct operations, so in our bottling operations. Uh, we're about 31 percent uh, of the way there, but really means it's sort of offsetting or giving back through supporting projects on reforestation, wetlands restoration, rainwater harvesting, drip irrigation, those kinds of things, uh, especially obviously in, in areas and communities where, where water stress uh, is an issue. So we're really working hard to uh, approach that. The further we've got into it, and, and through the dialogue with the World Economic Forum, I think also we've come to realize that you really can't sort of solve one problem in this space without taking into consideration other aspects. Uh, and so this water, energy, food uh, interrelationship uh, is really a very important uh, issue. And, and the way I think we envision it is that the, the, the complex you know, sort of uh, interdependence of those three key factors. Uh, is really being stressed by uh, demographic and economic growth, which is a good thing, but more and more protein, more and more people is going to require um, you know, more, and, uh, and at the same time climate change, which Manu talked about. And the combination of those stress factors is, is really accelerating, I think, some increased volatility in the relationship between and among those three, and really reducing the margin of error. Um, you could argue that those three have existed in relative stability, you know, within the, for the last two, three generations. Um, arguably, we're entering a phase where the, the new norm uh, is, is volatility. And, and that's going to create some real challenges for business and for government uh, to, uh, to, to work together to address these uh, complex challenges, for which single variant, sort of single solutions are, are really not going to be viable. Um, so we, we believe that business has a role to play in that through um, partnership, and we're certainly working in partnership with uh, with many organizations to, uh, to try to uh, advance uh, water security, water resource management, market-based solutions, um, and, and new business models, and policy dialogue, which is really at the heart of this Water Resources Group initiative, which is to bring together 
uh, business, uh, NGOs, and, and, and government uh, to really focus on how collectively we can work through these complex challenges uh, and make sure that we're um, making, making the progress we need to make. So with that. Thank you, Jeff. Um, what's interesting, again, I think from the, uh, the, the World Economic Forum platform looking at this, uh, this debate has been, um, you mentioned um, collaboration um, and uh, coalitions in your, in, your, in your overview there. Uh, and the fact that we're dealing with, even in a localized situation, a sort of common property resource, a, a public good issue, whereby even if you do as much as you can within your own um, fence line of operation, it doesn't matter if someone else is really kind of disturbing um, the water resource base next door. And it just in terms of those new frontiers of, of collaboration around these common property resource issues, I would commend to you, um, just if you look inside um, this book, um, go to um, about page three, and you will see that um, alongside uh, many of the other kind of attributions from um, well-known academics, you have the chairman and CEO of PepsiCo and the chairman and the CEO of the Coca-Cola company side by side, each with quotes um, about that very fundamental nature of collaboration um, on this issue set. Um, and uh, um, in the competitive world that we live in, um, the illustration of kind of collaboration um, on those sorts of natures, I think is, is compelling in itself. And I um, commend our industry partners um, who've been working with us on this space. Now, um, you mentioned also, um, um, Jeff, about this, uh, um, this water resource group and about um, some movements towards action. I'm delighted to be able to, to welcome here um, the global head of water, Usha Rao Manari, um, from the International Finance Corporation. And I guess there's a couple of things here. First of all is, what's the private lending arm of the World Bank doing in this space? Um, and we've heard a little bit about this water resources group, and, and you're taking the lead on this. Can you tell us some more about it? Thank you. Thank you, Dominic, and good morning to everybody. Um, let me preface my remarks about why IFC got involved in this with just a simple statement to say what we've heard so far, and I was fascinated to hear my, my fellow panelists here to talk about the link of water to all these other important challenges that the world or a country is about to face. And suddenly, I am delighted to see that water and water security is at the nexus of a whole other set of securities, food security, energy security, climate security, and something I heard yesterday, which we all know about but we don't articulate, human health and productivity security, mm. which is really, really important uh, for countries and policymakers in countries to worry about. The book here talks about food, water, energy, and climate, and the, I guess we would add another addition, which would include human health and productivity as well, because this is really very, very important. Why did we get involved as IFC? We're a multilateral, we're part of the World Bank Group. We, frankly, have been struggling with the issue of water for years, for decades, frankly. And what we found was, at, at, at one point, many of our clients in IFC came to us and said, IFC, we've never thought of water availability as a business risk. Today, suddenly, we are looking at water availability as one of our fundamental businesses. You heard that. You heard it from Jeff. You heard it from Peter. And this risk is going to affect not only our operations, but we worry about the productivity of the countries in which we are. So can you help us connect, if you will, to policymakers who may or may not be really aware of the gravity of the issue uh, connected to water? That's when we got involved. And, and Dominic has been talking about layering levels of complexity to the issue, and the Water Resources Group tried to say, okay, it is a complex issue, it has many dimensions. What we should do is try to simplify it, to really pull it apart and see what is it that is the water issue? Why is it at the nexus of all the other levels of security? And we found three or four things, and there may be other things, but these were the first three or four things that we found. And we found this as a group called the Water Resources Group, which I will come to in, in a second. But the three or four things we found was that solutions to water security can only occur when there's an explicit collaboration between stakeholders in the water sector. That is public, private, and civil society. If they don't all talk to each other and they don't stop operating within silos, solutions and sustainable solutions will not come about. Second, as everybody was saying, it's important to look at water holistically in all its uses. Why? Because otherwise, what has happened so far, there has been an overuse, complete and dramatic overuse of water in almost every country in the world, resulting in a dangerous decline in water sources. We're working in Karnataka, which I'll tell you in a second. There's been, there have been falls of 500 to 1,000 meters in water tables in the state of Karnataka. Farmers are saying, we don't have any water for the food that we have to grow. There's a reliance on non-renewable aquifers in Jordan. 
which is another serious issue, which uh, not just Jordan, but that whole region is worrying about how to secure water for their children and for the future of the country. So a holistic or integrated look of water is important. Third, we also found that there was really a paucity of facts and numbers and baselines, if you will, in the water sector, in the countries where we're working. People uh, were relying on numbers that were outdated, perhaps not reflecting reality today. And so it, was, it became really important to create these fact bases and using those fact bases to create a diagnostic which analyzed the fact bases simply and, and, and importantly so that everybody who looked at the issue and the solutions could understand it. And, and finally, we found that water, as many of my colleagues have said, is a very local issue. It is. The trouble with being a local issue is that it was never very high on the political agenda of a country, ever. And so what we also said was, in order to bring light to water, it should move up the political agenda and become a number one issue. And the way that has happened, willy-nilly, if I may say, is through looking at it through the other filters of food, energy, climate, et cetera, security. So we then sat down with a few of our partners, some of whom are uh, uh, represented on this table, um, and said, we should first come up with at least an initial thinking, right? on the issue of water security. And in November of 2009, um, we launched this report called Charting Our Water Future, which some of you may have seen already. And since then till today, we decided with our partners in the World Economic Forum and our private sector partners to actually use the diagnostic and the analytical approach that we came up with in that report to see if it can be applied to countries. I mean, one thing is coming up with a report, great, right? But it has to be actionable and has to be implementable. And so we've been working as Peter said, in India, state of Karnataka, Jordan, uh, and Mexico. Mexico particularly was what Upmanu was talking about, the whole climate variability issue of water security. And now we're moving into a few other countries. In doing this, we found that indeed, there was great relevance to, the, to our approach. Policymakers were very interested in it. Why? Because they said this is a very simple way of pulling apart the rather complex and myriad issues that water has given us so far. We haven't been able to move forward in it because we don't really understand what it is. And we haven't had the backing of other partners and stakeholders to actually push through reform, change, and other things that we'd like to do. So the Water Resources Group has been working in these countries. It is a, com it is a true, neutral, public-private platform consisting of multilaterals like ourselves, IFC, private sector companies, uh, like Nestle and Coca-Cola, and then the World Economic Forum. And we're working with civil society organizations that are giving us this holistic look at what could be potential solutions in the water sector. As, as, as has been uh, remarked, we're working in three countries. We have three other countries, two to three other countries, and if you will, a pipeline. Uh, and what we're doing here is not only to create information on the ground, but to use that information then to create a catalog or a knowledge base of best practice and lessons learned. Success doesn't just come from everything good that has been done, it also comes from what you shouldn't do. So we're trying to put together this kind of catalog at, at the level of the Water Resources Group. And I guess it was in January, we took the decision as a group of partners to formalize the Water Resources Group. So far, we've been a group of informal, well-intentioned sort of uh, entities that have come together to look at this issue differently. So we're now constituting the Water Resources Group as a formal entity. It will be housed in the IFC, at least for the foreseeable future. It will, it will, however, continue to be what has made it successful so far, which is a neutral, collaborative platform between the public, private uh, sectors, and civil society. I'll stop there, Dominic. I hope that was all right. Thank you very much for that. Um, so. Um, there we have it. You've had a, a number of different dimensions from uh, a number of different uh, 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 stakeholders uh, representing this issue. Um, we've got time. Uh, we've got about uh, uh, 18 minutes or so um, to take a couple of questions. So I'd be delighted to um, take a few, and then we'll kind of take them en masse to the panel. If you could say who you are and what you represent um, professionally, um, then um, we'll know where you're coming from in terms of your perspective. Um, sir. Okay, I'm I'm Jacob Scher, and I'm Director of Global Strategy and Advocacy for the Natural Resources Defense Council. A little more from a year, a year from now, uh, the leadership of the planet is going to come back to Rio uh, for the UN Conference on Sustainable Development. It will be the 20th anniversary of the first Earth Summit. And I'd be interested in hearing uh, from the panelists, uh, you know, sort of what you'd like to see happen uh, at Rio or in the months running up to Rio, where we could see real action on the part of, uh, of countries uh, uh, 
corporations and indeed communities to address the, the water security issue, which you've also articulately uh, uh, have talked about this morning. Thank you. We'll take a couple more for this first round. Uh, lady behind. Hi, good morning. I'm Tiffany Stecker. I'm with Climate Wire. I was wondering uh, if you could comment on this idea of the water footprint and uh, how accurate it is and uh, how, um, how it's been used in corporate settings, especially from Mr. Seabright and Mr. Brabeck. Thank you. One more. Hi, I'm Joe White with The Wall Street Journal. Um, I'd like to hear from the representatives from the two big uh, food companies um, what kind of government regulation they're willing to accept in the, in the area of water. I happen to know that Nestle has fought in Michigan efforts to control their withdrawals of water. Um, so I'm interested as they go forward what kind of uh, regulatory scheme they'd be willing to support. Great, thanks. Let's um, address those three and then we'll take a, take a few more. So um, we have uh, Rio Plus 20, we have the water footprint, um, and we have um, uh, discussions on regulation and policy. Um, perhaps if, um, maybe, um, Manu, you could pick up on the Rio Plus 20 piece. Yeah, I would be happy to. Um, one of the things Usha said, you know, really resonates with me, and uh, the way I would phrase it is that with the climate change debate, what happened was that a bunch of scientists got together, came up with scenarios, and then they went to a policy debate. What's been happening with water is that there's a large amount of noise in the political arena, and we do not have solid information to work from. One of the reasons we don't have solid information is because the data collected relative to water are spotty, but worse, each government feels that this is a gold mine that should not be revealed to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And unless we can get transparency on those things, it'll be very difficult. There are many things that we can collect information on on today's status, but with the fact that there's been tremendous variability in the way water has been used and what has been available in the past and climate, we need timelines so that we can put these things in perspective and then resolve uh, large-scale disputes about who gets what and what kind of allocations are actually feasible for people. So uh, I would really like to implore that something like that comes through. The second piece that I think has to be done with that is that once that sort of information is made at least more transparent than it is today, there should be comprehensive planning efforts which look at both the current state of technology to be deployed in this, but also novel technologies that are coming up. For example, or for solar thermal-based water disinfection and treatment, and for um, possibly growing food in non-land-based and non-traditional settings. These are things that will be solutions needed when we hit the 10 billion platform for people, but we need to start working on those simultaneously to today's issues. You're looking for quite substantive, kind of pragmatic, technological yeah. kind of conversations around the Rio Plus 20. Um, on, on behalf of the sort of MDB uh, community and, and IFC in particular, Isha, what's, what's your um, desire for um, an advancement in the conversation around the Rio Plus 20 agenda? So I have, I have one, uh, actually, and from, it's from what I said, as an MDB, what we have failed to do is to bring all the voices that are worried about the sector together around the same table to talk about the issues and come up with solutions. So what I would like to have is for public, private, and civil society to sit together and talk honestly and without positions on what the solutions could be. Thank you. Um, the water footprint issue was raised. Now, that's something that um, your organization has worked with others on, um, Jeff. So I wonder if you can offer some, some thoughts on that. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, well, it's, uh, you know, it's an important area because you, if to understand our impact and how we can um, um, sort of affect change, we need to understand what that footprint is. And we've da taken a look at a, a whole range of our products. I'll just give you, um, you know, some examples. A, we, we looked, and it's very local. Let me let me begin by saying that we've said local eight times now up here. Um, it really depends on on the local um, um, operation. So, uh, a 500 milliliter Coca Cola from the Dongan uh, uh, bottling plant in the Netherlands has about 70 liter, 35 liters of water associated with that 500 milliliter package. That's based on work that we've done in conjunction with the University of Twente in the Netherlands, um, and. Uh, you know, if there were a different configuration, it might be uh, a, a different number slightly. The vast majority of the water footprint comes from the agricultural inputs, that the, the, in this case, the beet sugar 
uh, used for the, the sweetener in that beverage. Um, a liter of simply orange, orange juice, 300 to 400 uh, liters of water, 99% of that is in the growing, and it depends a lot on whether it's Brazil or Florida because there are different rain-fed you know, uh, aspects to that. So it's all very, very, very local. Um, it ends up um, you know, really requiring a, 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 a very local frame. So I, I hope that, that answers the, the question. What strikes me about the, uh, the water footprint debate is that although people will tend to focus on the number at the end of the, of the, of the machine, if you like, actually it, it perhaps helps identify across the value chain um, where, 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 absolutely, yeah. and, and as a result, so, you know, the amount of water that we require to actually produce the product and the operation, the, 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 the actual bottling operation or processing in the case of food and beverage more broadly is quite small. Um, from, from an energy perspective, um, um, uh, Samantha, is there um, value in the water footprint um, discussion from, as you can see it? Yes, there's definitely value in the footprinting discussion, but it's really only an important first step to understanding the water equation in energy. It's not just how much water goes into each product at various points in the value chain, it's where that water comes from and the quality of that water. So footprints are crucial, but they're just a first step to understanding um, the interplay between energy or food and agriculture and water resources. No pun intended about footprints being just the first step there. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't even thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let, me, let me just add to that. I mean, when we do this, we, we look in terms of three different aspects, blue water, green water, and gray water. So, you know, really understanding. And for those of you point. who are now confused about those different types of water, I'm sure <laughs> there'll be um, clarity at the end. Um, to our uh, question from um, the colleague from the Wall Street Journal, um, Mr. Brobeck, if I can turn to, to you about this issue of um, uh, interfacing on the regulatory side, which is <coughs> always a, a, an interesting area. Yeah, it's a very interesting area because uh, I think the mineral water uh, industry is perhaps the longest regulated industry that there is, and rightly, by the way. So it really all starts uh, when you go back 120 years ago, 150 years ago, to when people went uh, to the um, places like San Pellegrino, places like Vitello Evian, in order to go for the functional quality of the water, which was considered to be good for your health. It was the first functional food that existed. Doctors were sending you for two weeks to go to Vitello to contracts in order to go for a cure. What happened then is that the people said, first of all, it's very expensive to go, and secondly, I want to have this product for the rest of my life also. So why cannot I buy the, the product and take it home? That's the way how the mineral water uh, industry started to exist. And immediately came regulation, and the regulation says, uh, an European one at least, that if you want to sell the water of a mineral source, you have to bottle this product at the source, and secondly, you cannot bottle in a container bigger than 1.5 liter. Third, for the bottler, you have to assure that the environmental quality of the surrounding of the source is absolutely being given. And third regulation is the sustainability. You are not allowed to take more water out than what can be naturally replenished. So this is a regulation that's over 100 years old, and I think it's a very good one, and I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of such a regulation because I think it assures exactly what we want to have which is a long-term, sustainable source of very good, healthy water. So yes, we are very much in favor of, of, of government uh, regulation in this area. Thank you. Um, further questions from the audience? Um, sir. Terry Tamanen with uh, Seventh Generation Advisors, a former Secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency, so I have some knowledge of water <laughs> issues in the West. Um, and we work now with uh, more than 400 sub-national governments around the world, states and provinces on climate change issues, and actually just launched something in cooperation with the UN called the R20 that is, is mm. dedicated to getting these sub-national governments working together. I wanted to ask uh, with your water resources group, uh, what is the thought about working with national governments when uh, we've just heard the term local? I think, Jeff, it's gone beyond eight. I think it's about <laughs> 16 or 20 by now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this is the same problem, obviously, the UNFCCC is facing yeah. with working only with national governments when these problems are very local. So, so what is the, the plan for getting down to that local level 
and uh, and perhaps a, a, what where do you see the the solutions? Are those also just local? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a good good question. Any others, um, sir? Hi, Eric Rosenberg with Ogilvy. Um, my question is: um, Peter Breivik said that. Uh, we're at a crisis situation right now on this issue, and yet we also hear that not much is being done at a governmental level. What does your research say would happen if nothing gets done, if we keep still keep kicking the can? You're talking mass uh, famine, uh, migration changes, uh, et cetera. Can you walk us through what your research says? Thanks. Okay. Okay, so um, let's just take those two. And perhaps we'll start with the latter one so we don't end on a kind of note of doom and gloom. <laughs> um, um, but um, um, in, in terms of, just maybe just kind of ask a, a, a sweep across the, um, the, the panel on this. In terms of if um, business as usual were to pervade from where uh, you collectively sit, what can you um, sense might happen? Um, Peter, if I could start with you. Well, I mean, the study which was done in 2003 and at the condition of 2003, and I mentioned before that this condition has unfortunately worsened because of this biofuel thing. At that time, it was very clear that if we continue like this, we will have a 30% shortage on grain production. That's a risk that we have today, as of today. Now, add to this now the whole question of biofuel. And I just want to point this out once more. You have to understand when we talk about biofuel that both agriculture are producing energy for the human consumption in calorie. We need 2,600, 2,800 calories per day as also energy for the fuel side. The difference is that the fuel market is 20 times bigger in energy in calorie than the, f and than the human kind, okay? So when politicians are telling us that they want up to 20% of the energy side being replaced by biofuels, what they are telling is that you have to triple, triple the food production. This is the consequences. In, if you want, I mean, any, any second class uh, pupil can do that, okay? If you want to replace 20% of a 20 times bigger market with a small what? what is the consultant? Three times more, okay? So this was the reason why food prices exploded in 2008 very clearly. People are saying today, governments are saying, well, we have speculation. Well, if you, if you offer such, an, uh, such a perspective, I don't think it's speculation. It's very clear what happens. Prices will go up, okay? So this is a fundamental thing which we have to tackle once and for all. Otherwise, we will have a, a, a problem on food production very, very shortly. Thank you. Usha, I'm going to come to you at the end for this ask about the WRG and um, um, national versus yeah. subnational. But I'd just like to kind of um, go through our panel yeah. briefly on, you know, what might happen. Um, if I just, just hold that thought, because sure. I, I think actually I'd quite like to um, hear from um, our colleagues from IHS, Sira, um, um, not necessarily just on that kind of biofuel comment, but um, business as usual in the energy space and water. What's your viewpoint? Oh, that's no problem. Thank you. You know, I'm very fond of an expression. I can't remember which economist um, originally said this, but things that can't go on won't. And I see that um, with respect to several issues in the energy sector. What I see happening is that the energy sector is not going to be in front of the line for water resources. Um, human uses, agricultural uses, will always, will always win out. You'll cer you can certainly see efficiencies in these sectors, particularly agriculture. But I think the energy sector understands and perhaps needs to understand a bit more that um, it's not first in line and that it will need to work on its water footprint across, across uh, technologies. So I think the sector is well aware that it's not in front of the line and um, as time goes by we'll get better and better at um, sort of finding technologies that, that work with whatever conditions we're presented with. Thank you. Mr. Rock will have to um, leave us for another appointment, but we'll just kind of um, uh, close through on this. So, um, Jeff, if nothing changes, what, in your viewpoint, will be the consequence? Well, I, I think one of the important sort of findings in this uh, water resources group work was a very careful assessment of supply demand, both current and projected to 2030. And what was um, found was that there is a 40% projected 
gap between supply and demand by 2030 under a business as usual scenario. How that will get manifest, given the interrelated nature of, of water and the, and the different ways in which it, 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 it moves and, and, and is used, uh, remains to be seen. But what it portends is tremendous stress, stress in agriculture, stress in, in allocation for energy. I mean, uh, during the drought in the southeast, I live in Atlanta, several years ago there were several power plants in the southeast that, that uh, came close to having to shut down because there wasn't enough water inflow in rivers uh, to cool the thermoelectric power plants. Um, ESCOM in South Africa has faced similar kinds of things. Uh, you can well imagine the impacts on agriculture um, as, as well. So uh, uh, tremendous economic impacts, tremendous human impacts uh, in emerging markets where the ability to adapt to some of these changes is much less uh, in evidence. And I think as we look over the next 30 years, climate adaptation, climate impacts are being manifest and will increasingly be manifest through the water cycle, because water is the, is the, is the, the Earth's regulator. And so whether that's glacial melt or increased droughts or in, increased severity of weather, uh, it's going to have, I think, some significant impacts. And we're going to need much greater resilience to work through that. Thank you. Um, briefly, Professor Lull, if we don't do anything, where might we end up? I'm not as pessimistic. And I'll explain why. Uh, agriculture is the dominant water user, 70% worldwide. Uh, efficiency of water use in agriculture is 10 to 15 percent. So there's a huge opportunity there to actually do something. But the question is, if you don't do something, what happens? So I think the impact is economic. And since the econo impact is primarily economic, things will happen because those things do have a way of correcting themselves. I'll start with an example very quickly. In India, what we see is that in the state of Punjab, which grows most of the food, groundwater levels have been dropping the energy cost associated with this is borne by the state. That's 40 to 60% of all electricity used in the state goes for groundwater pumping. The state is now bankrupt. They are desperately trying to figure out what to do about it. So that's you know, a pressure point associated with it. Our simulations of what you could do in India with regard to agriculture show that by simply changing where what is grown in the country, you meet food self-sufficiency requirements, you increase net income, and you eliminate groundwater usage on average. Okay, so when you without increasing efficiency of use, you know, simply by changing where what is grown, so I, so what is starting to happen in India as a result of you know these kind of discussions is they are saying we have to switch where we procure specific grains from. So in effect, what I think will happen in the, in, is that there will be economic pain on the way. There's no doubt about that. Because if you want to increase efficiency of water use, you're going to have to spend money for that. And that has to come out of somewhere. But if you trade that against 40 to 60 percent of total electricity use being subsidized on an annual basis, that's not a big deal at all. So I think we will get through this uh, with some pain pain ahead, but opportunity for innovation from the sound of it. Um, now, just to, to, to close us out, if I may, um, uh, Usha, um, this question of um, the water resources group moving forward uh, and uh, local versus national, uh, what's your viewpoint on that to the gentleman's question? Thank you for your question. It was, it was an excellent one. I think compared to other issues, such as energy or even food security, um, water has always been a local issue. The trouble, however, has been so we've been so it's not only being looked at at the subnational government level, but really a local municipal level. If you look at countries, really down at the local mayor level. Even well-intentioned mayors, however, our research found as Water Resources Group, didn't have the means and the support to carry out solutions because of a few things which I mentioned. They didn't have the facts before them. They didn't have the stakeholder base backing them in their decisions and. Most of all, they didn't have, if you will, a national agenda support from high level, country level decision makers saying, okay, you can do this and we will support you in doing this. So what we found is that on the one hand, the solutions have to be quite local because it is a local challenge. I mean, it depends on your, your river basin or your water basin or whatever it is. But it cannot happen in isolation of anything else that's happening in the country. And two, it cannot happen in isolation of all of one use. It has to be integrated between all uses. So we found that, our research said, create a framework which is national in nature. Why? Because this country is connected to a global ecosystem, and water is becoming even a global issue now. So create a framework at the national level, but do the implementation or actioning of that framework and of that action plan at the local level. 
So I, I mean, I'm, I think we're running out of time, but that's kind of where our research is. I'm happy to spend a few moments, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, and I may I just um, thank you for, for listening to that overview. I do commend this as um, excellent bedtime reading um, <laughs> for you. And um, we'll be following up with questions um, quite carefully. Um, just for your interest, all the contributors who were in this book, and as many who obviously aren't um, able to fit on this panel, um, are available through um, the networks of the forum. If one wants to follow up um, bilaterally with questions or comment um, through uh, Facebook or other kind of virtual means, or indeed through um, um, the connections that we have, I'm sure that those who shared some time with us on this panel will also be delighted to take questions now or in the future if you, if you make the connect. Um, I'd just like to say that this is a program that is ongoing, as you've heard. So really, this is a, a, a live text. Um, shortly, it'll be placed on a, a forum website, so available for all to um, um, comment on and, and add to. Um, and uh, we hope to um, come back in a few years' time with um, some more details on these uh, case studies of, of where we're getting to on this debate to answer the question of um, you know, what's the journey going to look like. Thank you all very much for your attention and time. Very much appreciated. And thank you, panel. Thank you.